Welcome to Texas 2036's virtual series, Straight Talk Texas, where you have a front row seat to conversations important to our future. My name is Yanela Montoya, Special Assistant to the CEO here at Texas 2036. Joining us today is the founding dean of the University of Houston's Hobby School of Public Affairs, Kirk Watson. He and President and CEO Margaret Spellings will have a wide-ranging conversation discussing his time as mayor of Austin, to serving a state senator, to what he's looking forward to in his new role. Please welcome Senator Kirk Watson. It's a thrill and a treat to be with somebody uh, who has been a friend for a long time and has given so much to our state in so many different ways. And so, Kirk, welcome. Thank you. This is fun. Thanks for All what right. you're doing, too, by the way. I'm very excited about Texas 2036. Well, thank you very much. And we have a lot in common. And I know we're going to be working together over the yeah. years. Uh, listen, you have served at the state level, at the city level. Now you're in a higher ed institution. You really have devoted your entire life to public service. And we're grateful for that. You've made a lot of difference. And one of the things that I think people observe about you is you know, you're somebody and, and uniquely representing Travis County, where I think people uh, maybe have misjudgments about things there, uh, the People's Republic and all of that. You're somebody that's really worked across the aisle. Talk about that in these politically charged times. How do you do it? And then we'll talk about a good example of that being the recent school finance bill, House Bill 3. So just talk about politics. Sure. Yeah, sure. Well, let, let, me, let me just kind of riff on that a little bit. Um, and I'll say a couple of things. One is that uh, I always have felt like I lose out as a, as a public policy person or as a political leader or just in day-to-day -day life if I let those labels get too, too strict. In other words, once I, I, I always say you, we ought to throw away the labels when you're working on public policy. Now I get labels and, and, and labels sometimes are valuable, right? And, 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 and there's no question that I proudly carry labels. But what I mean by that is that if you, if you always let the label be all you're looking at, then what happens is you abdicate the responsibility to ever hear anybody again. Because once I get a label, oh, oh, you're a Republican. Well, I know everything I need to know about you. Oh, you're a Democrat. Well, I don't even need to hear anything you have to say because I already know it. Oh, you're a Tea Party. Oh, you're a rhino. Oh, whatever label we use. You're an environmentalist, a chamber person. And so what I've always felt like is I don't do as well as a public figure if I just shut down once I know what the label is. So because there may be some good idea and something we agree on. So I kind of come at it with, when, when we sit down to talk, I always ask, what are the first five things that we can agree on, as opposed to what are the first five things we ought to fight about? Because once we set out the agreements, then things can grow from that. And it's one of the reasons I feel like um, I've got dear friends, uh, that in this politically charged time, as you talk about, are people that don't vote in my primary. Um, so, so that's a, that, I've always felt like that's the first approach. The other part about that is, is that I think that we don't, we've lost or we've quit for some reason trying to listen to each other, create new ways to hear each other. You know, we have these things on um, uh, city council meetings and county commissioner court meetings and even hearings now at the Capitol and other places that we call them public hearings mm -hmm. where there ain't no hearing going on. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's, exactly. it's fighting and arguing. And so yeah. we've, created, we've created too many adversarial systems so that we, we talk past each other. And, then, and frankly, I think um, these things with Twitter and Facebook uh, have made that a little bit harder. So um, as I left the Senate, uh, you know, when I left the Senate to take on this job at the Hobby School of Public Affairs, um, I left with really close friends on both sides of the aisle because I didn't want that to interfere. I didn't want politics to interfere with that friendship and I didn't want it to interfere with my ability to do a good job because somebody may have a good idea. 
Exactly. Well, you know, House Bill 3, the recently enacted, you know, very comprehensive school finance and so much more bill uh, that passed virtually unanimously, uh, you know, came in the aftermath of what I think most observers saw as a really difficult period in our yeah. politics with the bathroom bill and the yeah. uh, all of that. And, you know, and, and so how did you you know, rescue uh, bipartisanship, or what role did you play in that? How did we come together in such a united way around around school finance, which affects every single community, every single person in this state, something that people feel very strongly about? Enormous, enormous, and enormous not only substantively, but emotionally. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's going to be enormous going forward. So let me, let me say a couple of things about that. First of all, um, I was very pleased that last session, uh, the Lieutenant Governor put me on the Public Education Committee. That was my first time. I, I served in the Senate, uh, but by the time I, I left, I'd served over 13 years, but I'd never been on the Education Committee. Wow. Now, then, going into this session, we knew it, it was going to be most likely, probably, a public education session. So uh, I was very pleased that I got to be on the Education Committee and the finance committee under those circumstances. I was also uh, very happy when he appointed me uh, to the conference committee on HB3. So I was in the big middle of it. Now, having said that, let me back up a little bit. The session before, the, the legislature, in my view, had for session after session, punted and, and, and avoided actually taking on what we should be doing in public education. And the session before HB3, um, I thought that the House did a pretty good job of, of looking at public education. Not so much the Senate. The Senate kept putting poison pills in that bill and pitching that dead cat back over to the House. And the House would say, we're not going to pass that. Don't do it again. Well, here you go back again. So I was disappointed in, in the way that all played out. And then what happened was the House sent over to the Senate the creation of a public education commission. Well, I kind of stomped around. I must admit, I stomped around and said, you know, we're supposed to be the commission. You know, they elected us to do this, lock the doors, call a special session and make us do our job. I ended up voting for that commission made up of a lot of experts because there was nothing better to vote for, right? Right. Well, let me just say, live and on TV, <laughs> you're never going to hear me say I was wrong. So let's just say I wasn't as right as I would have liked to have been <laughs> because it did great work. And it led to a great bill and a process right. that worked. Exactly. And when it showed up, when it showed up, there was something very good and substantive to work from. Right. And, it, and it's one of those things where, go back to what I was saying a minute ago, you need to listen every now and then, because we weren't ready session before last. That work that was done, that very good work, made a big difference. And then it also pointed out ways that you could find uh, bipartisanship or nonpartisan. You could make substantive decisions that weren't based in partisanship. So, Mart, as you know, some of the things, some of the best parts of that bill was the recognition that it does cost more money to educate kids that are living in poverty. Right. And, exactly. and, and it does cost a lot more to educate those kids that are living in pockets of poverty. So how do we set that up in a way that makes a difference and achieves very real goals? So uh, I was very pleased to get to play a leadership role in that. And um, we ended up with a good bill. Now I will say what I said the day we passed it and the day we ended up leaving Sine Die, I said, look, will we have the discipline to keep financing this? Exactly. That'll be the question. And now with COVID, it becomes an even harder question. So um, yeah, we, we, can't, we can't go back. We got, well, we got to find a way to do it right. 
Exactly. And so when we think about, you know, part of our work at Texas 2036 is trying to lay out a roadmap so people can establish priorities. As you look at House Bill 3, which has early childhood equity, teacher pay, rewards for closing the achievement gap, uh, an extended year, on and on, what do you think are the most important priorities of that legislation uh, that, that need to be attended to in a- Well, I'm, I'm going to- I agree with everything you just said um, and, and how you kind of lay it out. And, and I don't think I want to be, I, I don't want us to start trying to pick out, pick it apart at this point. That was a test question. I didn't know if you were going to fall for that or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, um, it, it, it's, it's premature to do that in my view. Instead, what I think is go back to the question I said, are we going to have the discipline to do this right? Mm -hmm. And I think what we do is we, we don't try to recreate the past and we don't judge our success by the way we've always done it. Oh, we're broke. Yeah. Uh, we're broke. So, so where are we going to start cutting immediately? Yeah. This is an opportunity in my view to really look at what we do from a revenue standpoint and, and say, you know, we, 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 we had this perception. We believed we were affluent enough that we really didn't need to think about this or worry about that. But what COVID has done is it's exposed a lot of our weaknesses, including exposed the weaknesses of our very, very, very limited revenue streams. Sales tax is in, is, is in a shambles, even though, as you know, it's the, it's right. the biggest part of, it's the biggest revenue stream in, in the state budget. But with Seven. COVID, Seven. Several, yeah, exactly. You go, go you, you've immediately gone to the, the right second place in all, in terms of where our revenue. So, so I think it's, instead of starting with where do we cut, mm -hmm. that's, just, that's old thinking in my view. The way we do this is we start with how do we, how do we change the way we do things? And I'm, let me give you an example. A couple of sessions ago, we needed a lot of transportation money. Mm -hmm. We still need a lot of transportation money. Yep. And one of the things that we did is we created an entitlement for roads out of our sales tax revenue. Right. Well, I won't go into all the details of that, but that, I can remember asking the question, what happens if we have a 2011 legislative session where the budget is really tight and we've segmented this out that it goes just for roads and we can't use it on education or healthcare or something else? Well, we had this perception of affluence and this was going to go on forever and life was going to be great. Yeah. Well, I'll give you one quick example we ought to allow for other revenue sources for transportation that we've put off the table. Things like, and I know this oh, is not right. toll roads. Exactly. Roads. Exactly. exactly. I mean, you've got to exactly. exert, if we, if we allow, think of all the private equity that is out there that is pent up, has pent up demand for where it's going to put it. Why not let them take the risk on some of these roads? We can fix our roads and we can free up things like sales tax, so that we might not have to make certain cuts in a, in a very, very, very good education. So that's a segue into a topic I want to get into with you, because you've been a mayor, you've been a state senator, you're now in a higher ed institution. You know, obviously the state has created these entities called school districts, cities, counties, hospital districts, utility, and on and on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, how should we be thinking about local control, which we Texans have always been for, in an environment that seems like the state wants to have more and more uh, say over what these entities do, whether it's build toll roads or have partner benefits or recycling programs or pay for performance for teachers or on and on. Talk about that and your lens on it. Well, uh, a couple of things, uh, and, I, and I'll, this may not be an organized thought, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to. Number one is, you know, as the old, the old mayor in me, uh, in, in a city that we did a lot of good, and I mean, uh, Austin was blowing and going, and uh, I always whined 
that I didn't have, the state didn't give us enough tools to take care of things like growing the economy. Um, and, and they're just, they're, the state didn't provide you with tools. So my, my response to always was, if you're not going to provide the tools, right. then get out of the way. Yeah. Let, let us make the decisions. You know, people are flocking to this town and you don't like some of the decisions, but, but the election that elected me mayor was just as important as the election that elected me to the state Senate. Right. And, and, and so if you're not going to provide tools for positive, then get out of the way and, and, and let, let it op, let the local governments operate. The second thing I would say is that we saw how that could work at the very beginning of the COVID pandemic. If you mm -hmm. remember at the very beginning of that, it was, it was very, uh, state was working very closely with local government. Yeah. And, and there was a reason for that. The response at the local level to a disease pandemic requires that, that local activity, be, you pay attention to that local activity, including the culture of your community and mm -hmm. how your community will respond. So what the state, in my view, when, when, when the state started saying, oh, you can't do that, oh, you can't do that. Homeless. That, that's right. What it, what it missed was that what we ought to let the state do is the state can set certain goals, parameters, uh, 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 outcomes. Yeah. Say that again. Outcomes. like Outcomes, exactly. And, and then turn it over and say to the local community, you guys now, you, ha you have to, there are certain standards. So you can have a state standard, but let the local governments figure out how best to achieve those. And now you're starting to see it a little bit more, right? Because it, it wasn't working. We're seeing this big spike. And now at the state level, they're starting to say, okay, okay, local governments, how can we do this? Okay, you can do this. Because it ultimately ends up working better. Right. That, that look, this, you know this, the state economy and all the work y'all are doing with the data that you're doing, that really points to it in my view. And that is that, in essence, we don't really have a state economy. Right. It is the sum of its regional component parts. Exactly. And our regions are different. Let them be different. Let them succeed because by their success, then the sum is successful. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So, so Kirk, I want to ask you about your new gig and you know, obviously you care deeply about public policy and now you've got the mandate of educating a generation of people that are gonna come after, after people like us and get on the battlefield and tackle these things. Talk about what your aspirations are for the hobby school and the role you're gonna play in leading it. Well, it's very exciting. Uh, otherwise I wouldn't be doing it. You know, I, I, I came out of the last session of the legislature. My colleagues had elected me president pro tem. Um, as we just talked about, HB3 was a, my government transparency uh, bills that I've been working on for multiple sessions, they passed. Uh, my sexual assault on college campus bills that, that we, we, uh, up, we even added to what we've done. Uh, and I could go on and on. I came out of the last Dell Medical session. School. Dell Medical School. Dell Medical School, yeah. The role I've played in Dell Medical School here uh, and what we were doing with and are doing with the Austin State Hospital and brain health. So I came out of the last session of the legislature happier than I'd ever been after a legislative session. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I kind of felt like I was at the top of my game and, and I was very happy. Uh, so to leave the Texas Senate under those circumstances uh, really required uh, more than just another job. It required a very compelling platform uh, that, that was exciting to me in public service, by the way. I mean, you, you know, that's, that is kind of where I am in life. Um, the idea that I get to be involved in essentially building a world-class public policy school, uh, basically from the ground up in the state's largest city, the country's fourth largest, soon to be third largest city, arguably uh, the nation's most diverse city, that is the center of the universe, if you will, on everything from healthcare to uh, energy, okay. to immigration, I mean, you name it. 
um, so that that not only do you work to provide the skills and education for the next great generation of public policy leaders, whether they are in government or private industry or nonprofits or philanthropy, what an exciting opportunity. Not to mention the fact that the school itself, a bird just flew it into my window. Sorry, that's why I wow. it scared me. Um, but, but the other thing to think about with this is this public policy school will plug in to public policy discussions and debate, whether it's by uh, research or symposia uh, or white papers or whatever we need to do. Just, just this past week, uh, Mayor Turner appointed me uh, to his uh, policing reform task force. Terrific. And, and so there, there's roles to play that it's a tremendous opportunity. So I'm very excited. In fact, you see me, I, um, I dress for the occasion. I, I see that. And, and we, Texas 2036 and the Hobby School, are really looking forward to a lot of work together. We've had some conversations yep. about that, and we will. And uh, I'm going to look forward to that with your new hat <laughs> on and uh, know that we'll, uh, we'll have a lot of fun doing good, too. So, Kirk, thank you for being with us today. And uh, all the best. Thanks for all your amazing service to Texas over so many years. You're nice to say that. Thanks for what you're doing. Great to be with you, Margaret. Appreciate it. Thanks, Kurt. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you all for watching Straight Talk Texas. If you have questions and feedback we want to hear from you, email us at straighttalk at texas2036.org and follow us on social media and sign up to receive our emails. Visit texas2036.org for more information. Until next time, wishing you and your family well.